Oldsmobile launched a new sedan with an old name for 1997. Sharing basic structure and styling with the Chevrolet Malibu, the 1997 Oldsmobile Cutlass came with a higher level of standard equipment. Catering to conservative car shoppers, the new Cutlass sedan was not necessarily flashy, but did offer a blend of utility, features, and reliability. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the 1997, 1998, and 1999 Oldsmobile Cutlass, and also the rise and fall of the Oldsmobile brand. So grab a sparkling sour apple candy can, kick back, and let's get down to the nitty gritty. <music> Production of the N-Body, a General Motors front-wheel drive platform, can be traced back to 1984, when it was initially used to underpin several GM cars that were new for 1985. By 1992, there was a revised second version of the N-Platform. The Oldsmobile Cutlass Calais was dropped, and there was now the new Achieva. Nameplates from other GM divisions, such as the Buick Skylark and Pontiac Grand Am, carried on. By 1993, a new intermediate sedan for Chevrolet was in the works. This future sedan would go on sale later in the decade as the Chevrolet Malibu. With Wayne Cherry in charge of the design work, it was later confirmed that the Oldsmobile division would get a mildly revised variant of this upcoming Chevy sedan. And this future sedan would utilize the next generation of the front-wheel drive and body platform. 1996, an all-new sedan, the Oldsmobile Cutlass, entered production this year, being built exclusively at the Oklahoma City Assembly Plant. 1996 would mark the final year for the long-running A-Body Cutlass Sierra. Oldsmobile had a loyal following, and the execs at General Motors were hoping to lure would-be Sierra buyers over to the new Cutlass, which was similarly priced, but much more contemporary than that outgoing A-Body sedan. 1997. This marked the initial model year of the N-Body Oldsmobile Cutlass. Weighing about the same as the outgoing Sierra, this new Cutlass was 400 pounds lighter than the W-Body Cutlass Supreme sedan. Riding on a third version of the N-Platform, now referred to as the GMX-130, and despite a few minor cosmetic differences, it was very apparent that the new sedan was closely related to the Malibu, sharing basic structure and styling with the Chevy. This new in-body cutlass came with a higher level of standard equipment as well as styling and trim variations. For example, you could forget about the standard four banger that came with the 1997 Malibu. Instead, Cutlass Spires were treated to the 3.1 liter V6 engine. The mill cranked out a reasonable 160 horsepower and 185 pound-feet of torque, moving the sedan to 60 miles per hour from a complete stop in about 8.1 seconds. While the Malibu offered two trim levels, Base and LS, the Cutlass did the same, being available in Base and GLS. On the inside, passengers would be greeted with a well-designed dashboard with neat A-pillar air conditioning vents and the ignition switch placed on the dashboard rather than the steering column, giving the car a modern look. For buyers seeking something a bit smaller, the Achieva was still available, though its days were numbered. Utilizing a version of the N-Platform, the Achieva overlapped with the 1997 Cutlass at dealerships, since it was still being sold at the time. Speaking of 1997, Oldsmobile continued to offer the W-Body Cutlass Supreme in their showrooms. But unfortunately, this ultimately continued the confusion with some customers regarding various Cutlass models. By 1997, however, the W-Body Cutlass Supreme was a bit long in the tooth, especially considering its counterparts, such as the Buick Regal and Pontiac Grand Prix, were already redesigned by now. But despite the W-Body Supreme being dated, it was still positioned above the new M-Body Cutlass on the showroom floor. Fast forward to 1998, the Cutlass Supreme name was dropped and a new, updated sedan would be sold as the Oldsmobile Intrigue. Sleek and stylish, the Intrigue adopted Oldsmobile's new design language and quickly grew in popularity amongst customers. Check out our 1998 Oldsmobile Intrigue episode to learn more about that particular car as well. 
Once Oldsmobile finally decided to drop the Cutlass Supreme nameplate, the M-Body sedan would be the only remaining model to carry the torch and bear the Cutlass name. Throughout most of the car's production run, changes were minimal. A new GL trim level eventually replaced the previous base model. GM had been readying an all-new car that was slot below the Intrigue in Oldsmobile's lineup. Utilizing a new variant of the M platform, now referred to as the GMX 130, the all-new Alero became available for the 1999 model year. Meanwhile, this particular Cutlass would have a short run, with production wrapping up on July 2nd, 1999. Out of the four A-body cars introduced in 1982, only two lingered on until the mid-90s, the Buick Century and the Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra. Despite being on the market for 15 years, with few modernizing modifications to the chassis and styling, the Cutlass Sierra was a hot seller for the Oldsmobile division. When General Motors debuted the A-body Cutlass Sierra in 1982, they did not intend for it to have as long of a production run as it did. By 1996, the Sierra was certainly antiquated by automotive standards. But even with that being the case, the Sierra proved to be so popular amongst consumers, the execs at GM were left with no other choice but to keep it in production. Even by 1996, the final year for the Sierra, it still held the best-selling vehicle title in the Oldsmobile lineup. The in-body Cutlass didn't quite match the sales figures of the Sierra. However, the execs at GM were hoping to woo some of those prospective A-body customers with fresh, contemporary styling and a load of standard equipment. In fact, the loaded Malibu LS siphoned a bit of in-body cutlass sales since many buyers identified them as identical cars, with the Chevy variant being the overall better value. Once the Achieva was dropped, there was a void in the lineup for a smaller vehicle. Ultimately, this void would be filled with the Alero. When the new Alero hit the scene, it sported unique styling inside and out. Oldsmobile's newest offering was also available as a two-door coupe and with a manual transmission. A much more sportier vehicle, indeed. But many were left wondering why didn't Oldsmobile decide to brand this car as the new Cutlass? After all, many felt as though this car was a much better fit for the Cutlass nameplate than the Malibu-based sedan that came before it. In the early 90s, the Oldsmobile brand was growing stale. The execs wanted to target a younger demographic, but also came to grips with younger shoppers' resistance to purchase from a brand which was generally known for producing old people's cars, especially with some models with their vinyl roofs and wire wheel covers. This is what launched the whole This Is Not Your Father's Oldsmobile campaign. More on that later. For the 1995 model year, the Aurora hit the scene. A stylish and thoroughly modern large sedan, it sported a 32-valve V8, world-class architecture, and a fresh, contemporary look inside and out. The Aurora would prove to be the first vehicle of an entirely new lineup of New Age Oldsmobiles that would help the brand ditch the old school image. And the execs figured out another way to ditch the old image, and that was by coming up with new model names. With all that being said, it wasn't long before familiar nameplates were put on the chopping block. For example, the 98 badge was last used in 1996. In another example, the new for 1998 sedan was initially going to be the redesigned Cutlass Supreme, but that name was axed and the sedan was renamed Intrigue. The execs wanted to continue this trend with their new unique cars, cut ties with the past and forge a new path for their products, hence the fresh new names such as Alero and Intrigue. Ultimately, the plan worked and the new products attract the younger buyers to Oldsmobile's showroom floors, just as the execs anticipated. In 1986, Oldsmobile sold 1,059,390 cars. Fast forward to 1991, and Oldsmobile would move 458,124 vehicles. Still a good amount, but significantly less than just several years prior. 
To introduce the reimagined front-wheel drive 1988 Cutlass Supreme Coupe and shake up the brand's old-school image, Oldsmobile launched an ad campaign with the slogan, This is not your father's Oldsmobile. This was the exec's way of communicating to the public that Olds was building a different kind of car for a different kind of buyer. But unfortunately, sales dropped as a result. At the time, the age of the average Oldsmobile customer was 70. However, this older demographic proved to be a very loyal customer base. So once the ad campaign launched, it upset many customers. On the flip side, it is true that the new GM10 Cutlass Supreme was a different type of Oldsmobile. But looking at the rest of the product line, everything else available was still your father's Oldsmobile. Sales dropped from 715,270 units in 1988 to 602,159 in 1989. Mike Losh became general manager in June 1989. Sales figures declined steadily, ending 1992 with 416,126. In April of that year, 1992, John Rock took the place of Losh as Oldsmobile general manager. Several months after Rock arrived in 1992, General Motors was dealing with major financial problems. Word on the street was the company would be filing for Chapter 11 reorganization, but these rumors were swiftly shot down. There was speculation regarding whether or not Oldsmobile would become the casualty of a downsized GM, a measure that would make the company more profitable. Sometime during the fall of 1992, a GM insider informed the media that the board of directors was reviewing a proposal to drop Oldsmobile. Once again, GM quickly denied the rumor. But what really happened in 1992 was GM's board of directors came within a hair of terminating the Oldsmobile brand for good, but pulled back at the last minute to give the brand one more chance. But from the perspective of customers, dealerships, and employees, Oldsmobile was now damaged property. Rock quickly responded to the rumor and tried to establish a sense of continuity and purpose to the Oldsmobile organization. He reassured employees and dealers that the brand would be sticking around and was not going anywhere. Next, Rock coordinated development of a new product and business plan. This new plan would be put into place as a way to revamp Oldsmobile's image and set a new path for the brand's products and the way they conducted business. Ultimately, this would be referred to as the Centennial Plan. Saturn's customer care and business practices proved reliable and the Centennial Plan would adopt many of these methods. The new model lineup would target younger buyers, those who would otherwise purchase from Japanese brands. The change would be dramatic because at this point, Buick and Oldsmobile were so similar, buyers actually cross-shopped the two brands. Earlier in this discussion, we mentioned Mike Losh, the brand's previous general manager. Losh is the individual who approved the Aurora, and the new sedan was in the pipeline scheduled for a 1994 debut after a bit of a delay. Rock approved a new front-wheel drive mid-size car. The car would come to fruition as the Intrigue and would arrive in 1997 for the 1998 model year. A smaller car, the front-wheel drive Alero, was approved to debut in 1998 for 1999. There will also be an all-new Bravada, arriving for 2002. Rock made some significant changes during his tenure as general manager, and ultimately, Darren Clark took his spot in 1997. The Intrigue and Alero boosted Oldsmobile's overall sales to 329,742 in 1998 an 8.2% increase over 1997. So far, things were looking better, but soon enough, something else happened that contributed to the downfall of the Oldsmobile brand, and that was a strike. Launched in the spring of 1997, the all-new Intrigue was well-received amongst car shoppers and exceeded the projected sales numbers. But after a 54-day strike in 1998, all of that traction gain had now been lost, with sales never recovering. The execs kept their fingers crossed, 
hoping to move 100,000 intrigues annually, but fell far short of that goal. By 1999, there was a new general manager. The execs set a new goal of moving 400,000 units per year. There were also hopes to sell 140,000 of the new Aleros in 1999. Unfortunately, both of those goals were far from being met. Francis left Oldsmobile in early 2000, and Deborah Kelly Ennis took her spot. Around this time, Oldsmobile sales dropped 17.9%. Oldsmobile entered the year moving only 289,172 units. That was a far cry from the 400,000 sales target the brand set for itself just a year prior. Dealers pointed their fingers at GM management for the brand's failure, but management turned around and blamed dealers. In December 2000, it was finally announced that the brand would come to an end once and for all and 2004 would mark the final model year for Oldsmobile. In January 2001, CEO Rick Wagoner admitted that he made the decision to shutter the brand, mentioning that it would be more appropriate to terminate the brand and reallocate its funds to stronger brands, like Buick or Chevrolet for example. So in other words, despite the desperate attempts made by the execs, Oldsmobile production had remained unprofitable and the brand was ultimately axed as a strategic move to streamline its operations and ensure the viability of GM's other brands in a competitive market. In its heyday, Oldsmobile enjoyed a ton of success. The Cutlass series became the best-selling car in the United States in 1976. Oldsmobile was a pioneer of car making, but in 2004, the last one to roll off the assembly line would be a dark red Alero sedan. As always, thanks for coming out to the show, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Until next time, this is your host Rob, and thanks for tuning in to Antique Tags. Thank you.